we are going to be talking about St. Patrick. When you hear the name St. Patrick, what are some of the things that come to your mind? Perhaps it's the St. Patrick's Day, which is every year on March the 17th that we celebrate the day of St. Patrick. Perhaps it's some ale or some green ale, which will make today's lesson a lot more enjoyable. (laughs) Perhaps it's a pinch if you're not wearing green or the leprechaun who's always looking for his elusive pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Anything else that comes to your minds? Uh, Snakes, absolutely. Why is that? Well, of course, St. Patrick is the one that banished all the snakes from Ireland. Very good. Uh, This morning, to prepare for the lesson, I had breakfast. (laughs) I ate up all of me lucky charms. So it put me in the mood for a little bit of St. Patrick. Now, we talked about the leprechaun, the little elusive men of Ireland, and they wear green, and the reason for that is that they are harder to be seen in the emerald green lush land of Ireland. Now, if you wear green, it's harder for them to see, and so that's why on St. Patrick's Day, we wear green to kind of mold into the environment, and the leprechauns are less easy to see you, and so that's why we give you a little pinch if you're not wearing green, to remind you to wear the green so that you can be more elusive to the leprechauns. Now, if we're really, really lucky, we will get a foot dancing leprechaun like Lord of the Dance. Now, I wanted to ask in our room, do we have anyone that's from the Isle of Ireland? Anyone travel this far to come to church today from Ireland? Anyone? Do we have any of Irish ancestry? Ah, yes, maybe some Scotch-Irish among us today. Could I get some of you to come up and do a little foot stomp dance, could you? That would be quite enjoyable. Do we have any of the fighting Irish? Ah, Anyone else fighting Irish from Notre Dame? Excuse my French. So as we're moving on, I want to show that St. Patrick was born somewhere between 373 and 389. We are really not sure when. He was born up in northwest England. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but I want to bring you into the context just a little bit geographically. All of the red that you see there is the Roman Empire at its height. And there you have a spread out empire making it harder and harder to control. Now it was Diocletian who separated it into four groups and they had four sub generals that would rule each area, making it a little easier for him to take care of. But Constantine brought it all back into the one emperor rule and he used Christianity as the mortar to keep the empire together. Now let's zoom in a little tighter up here to England. And England was the only part that was controlled by Rome. Now, this was a very good thing for the English. And this is why. All of the bands around them, you have the Picts and the Irish, were just marauding groups of nomads. And they had their their clans and tribes, but there was no identity within the country. It was every man for himself. And England was the same way until the Romans brought in their civilization. And they would have loved to continue spreading out. In fact, the only reason they attacked England is because Julius Caesar ran out of places to attack. And if you are a good general and a good emperor, you have to have some military behind you. So he was just looking for somewhere else to attack and defeat. And after two or three tries, he was able to defeat England. So it brought a lot of uh, national pride to the country. It was said that just before Rome was sacked, The Roman citizens in Britain sent word to the emperor saying, uh, hey, we're going to need some help to reinforce all of our borders because the, the attacks are starting again. And Rome sent back this message, just like a television show that I was watching the other day where the, the woman looked into the man's eyes and she says, am I losing you? He looks back into her eyes and says, take care of yourself. 
That was the message that came back, and eventually Rome was sacked, and the Roman Empire dissolved, except for in the east, which ran another thousand years. But for this area, they were not able to continue. Uh, You see the little star flashing? That is approximately where Patrick was born with his family. And I'm going to let you all know a few of the sources that we use to look at St. Patrick's life. Uh, Only three. First one is the confession that he wrote toward the end of his life. He recounted his spiritual journey. He, he didn't really want to, but he said he did it in order to help the f- later generations understand what God did through him. He also wrote a letter toward the end of his life to Croticus, which was a pirate. We're going to get a little bit of insight into Patrick's life from that letter. Those are really the only two things, as, as Mark wrote this lesson, that were reliable texts of what we can understand from St. Patrick's life. Most scholars agree that he wrote this deer's cry, which we'll look at a little bit later too. So just a little bit of St. Patrick's history. Of course, he wasn't saint at the time. You're usually made saint after you're dead. And if there's a miracle that's attributed to your life, one of the miracles, of course, is that Patrick banished all of the snakes from Ireland. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Well, turns out that Ireland never really had snakes to begin with. So that was still miraculous, I guess, but Ireland really doesn't have snakes. And so it was was an easy win for him. So We're going to jump back to Patrick when he was growing up. Uh, When he was growing up, he had a very wealthy family. They had a lot of land, a lot of houses, a lot of livestock. They had a lot of slaves. Things were very well. And if Patrick hadn't have gotten snatched up by these marauding bands of marauders from Ireland, Patrick probably would have had a pretty decent life. But at age 16, he was thrown into slavery. But before that, we understand that his his family was Christian. Um, We know that, or we suspect that, his family was Christian because his dad's a deacon in the church, which that doesn't mean that you're a Christian, I guess. Also, his grandfather was a priest in the church, so more than likely, he was raised in a Christian family. But Patrick made it clear in his confession that he was not saved, and he was very rebellious. So at age 16, the marauders came, and and they stole thousands of people. I want to read a little bit of Confession 1 from uh, Patrick. He says, I, Patrick, a sinner, a most simple countryman, the least of all the faithful, in other words, I'm, I'm not saved, I'm not even spiritual, and most contemptible to many, I did some bad things. I did not indeed know the true God, and I was taken into captivity in Ireland with many thousands of people. We did not keep his, God's precepts, nor were we obedient to our priests, who used to remind us of our salvation. And the Lord brought down on us the fury of his being and scattered us among the nations, even to the ends of the earth, where I, in my smallness, am now to be found among foreigners. So Patrick was saying, hey, I I, I wasn't saved. I was not a a good person at at a young age. And it reminds me of the story of Daniel in the Old Testament. And when Daniel, an Israelite, was taken into captivity, what did Daniel and his friends do? They did the right thing. They said, hey, we don't want to eat your food. We'll eat the food that our God says that we should eat so that we can be stronger and we will be better slaves. But here Patrick is saying, we and the many thousands didn't do the right thing. We were not happy about where we were. And so I did not, Patrick said, I did not act the right way in that situation. Um, Patrick ended up becoming a shepherd because as a slave, he was assigned to a particular duty. Now, we have a lot of nice images of shepherds in our pastoral teachings here at the church. But being a shepherd is not a good thing. You pretty much live with the sheep. You spend all of your time with the sheep, with your livestock. Uh, You don't get to come in after a cold day. In fact, in Ireland, they had some very harsh winters. And so being a shepherd is not a fun job. What it did afford Patrick is the opportunity to spend a lot of time in reflection, thinking about his life as a young, uh, at this point, 16-year-old, when he began to find the Lord, remembering the teachings from his family. So, hey, parents, even if your kids are already grown, but especially if they're not, setting the example that Pastor David talked about today in your family, whether or not your children are obedient or rebellious, Patrick, rebellious, 
because of the opportunity that God gave him. And later Patrick said that this was an opportunity. If I was left with my family and their riches and all the things that went on with, went along with that, I may not be the person that God would want me to be. So here's his confession too. It says, and the Lord opened my mind to an awareness of my unbelief in order that even so late, I might remember my transgressions. Now he says late, he's about 16 years old. How many of you at 16 were not yet saved? Not that you didn't know about God, but you you hadn't made that commitment. You didn't, so several of us would say about maybe a, a fourth of this group that would be 16 and still not at the point of coming to belief. Now, I think about this too, that as a 16-year-old, how many of you have 16-year-olds or remember when your kids were 16? Remember when you were 16? What if you were plucked up and taken to a place of slavery, which was, was not good? It was a bunch of uh, difficult journeys, a lot of beatings, um, having to do what you don't want to do. Sometimes I feel like a slave in that respect. But other, other than that, to have you taken away to a place where you are not, you don't have your resources. You don't have people that are there for your benefit. It would be something that we would want to curse God and, and maybe even die. If, if this is going to be my life, the rest of it, I don't think it's worth living. Because I saw what life could be at home, rich, resources, parents' love, but now I don't have that. Patrick is remembering this. He says, they're remembering his transgressions and turn with all of my heart to the Lord who had regard for my insignificance and pitied my youth and ignorance. And he watched over me before I knew him and before I learned sense or even distinguished between good and evil. And he protected me and consoled me as a father would his son. In a difficult situation, looking back, this is, this is Patrick looking back, understanding that God was looking out for him even in the difficult situation. In our life, hardships are either going to pull us away from God or are going to push us closer to God. And I bet if we all just took a second, we could all imagine in our lives, remember some hardship that had taken place. Maybe right now that's for you. Maybe you're in the middle of a hardship among many or several. The question is, in your difficulties, in your hardship, or maybe the hardship of some loved one around you, do you see them being pulled? Do you see yourself being pulled away from God, doubting God, asking those hard questions leading to answers that are not uh, along the things of God, along that spiritual journey? Or do you see yourself being pulled closer to God? Well, at this point, this is where Patrick saw himself being pulled in closer to God as creation around him, a beautiful country, was revealing the majesty and the glory of God, Patrick would say in his confessions, that he was being pulled into God. In spite of the negative things, which he was taken at a young age, uh, he was far from his family support. And another thing that he he didn't really complain, but he talked a lot about the fact that he had a very low formal education because he was taken away from the time at the time when he would be getting more of that uh, higher education. And so he, he lamented that, but at the same time, he understood that God in your glory would take someone like me and do something so great. He did have some positive aspects. One is an, a keen understanding of God's word. Now, who does that? The Holy Spirit in our lives. So those of us who are lowly and also maybe a little ignorant when it comes to the things of God, we need to beg the paraclete, the helper, the one who came alongside, the Holy Spirit to reveal, if there's nothing else that we can do, God, please reveal to me your word so that I can at least walk in your ways. But God, if you have graced me to be an engineer, and I know a lot more things than probably the majority of people that are around me, God, please bless me with the opportunity to know and read your word and to gain keen insight into your word. Don't let me only reflect and rely on other people's insight, but God, give me insight. One of the things that Patrick did had to spend a lot of time in prayer, but he also knew scripture so well as he aged through his life that scripture would just flow from his conversation. It wouldn't just be, um, hey, let me tell you what the Bible says. He would just speak scripture in his normal everyday 
conversation. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to see what it would be like to have Scripture so ingrained in your, in your mind that you have Scripture. Dieter here, a member of our class, is, uh, has memorized a lot of different Scripture. I've asked Dieter to come and just explain, uh, to describe to us what it's like to have memorized such vast amounts of Scripture and then to quote a little bit of Philippians, which is what uh, Patrick used one time in, in uh, his confession. Uh, thanks, Pastor Brent. Um, yeah, well, we say a lot of scripture. I memorize Philippians and Romans. So that's a lot to learn, but the trick is to keep it all straight. So, but uh, um, why, why do you memorize scripture? I mean, it's, these are the words of life, aren't they? Mr. Sam, when I was a college student, I don't know how many college students there are. When I was a, just starting in college, Mr. Sam was our Sunday school teacher. And he gave us a lesson on Philippians, actually a series, a whole semester he taught us on Philippians. And it struck me when he talked about, in chapter, chapter 1, verse 8, he talked that we may be blameless. And he, he gave the example, at least as I recall it, of how back in the day then they with clay pottery, if you, could, if you sold your pottery and it had cracks in it, you would put wax in the crack, and then you could paint over it. And when you looked at it, everything looked great. But when you put the heat in it, then you had a problem. And I thought, wow, that I could so understand Scripture in that sort of way to make it come to life. To me, was... Uh, was very motivating, and from that day I decided I'm going to memorize Philippians, and after that I, um, I memorized Romans. So I've had the chance to quote it to a number of people, a number of groups, churches, and I even did it once in a coffee shop where they were, where they were making espressos and people were sleeping and coming through on their bicycles. But you know what? The Word of God is quick and powerful, and it's alive. It's living and active. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So um, I'm going to speak to the camera. My wife is not here. She's in uh, southern Alberta and Canada visiting her parents. And she, uh, she's always been here with me when I've done this. So honey, I can hopefully you're watching. So this is for you. Her dad is really hard of hearing. So if you hear something coming from southern Alberta, it's the volume up so that he can hear. So let's begin. Philippians 1, 12 to 2, 18. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and more fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ may be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet yeah, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, 
whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. For this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggles you saw I had and now hear that I still have. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and the service coming from your faith, I am glad and will rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. That is our lesson today. Amen? Amen. Thank you. I asked Dieter if he'd be available to quote scripture, and he said, well, I'm going to be with my wife in Canada. And I said, well, you missed opportunity. He was on a plane. No, <laughs> just kidding. But the sentiment that he just quoted from Philippians 1 and the end of 2 is exactly where St. Patrick is. Did you hear what he said? To live as Christ, but to die as gain. I consider what has happened to me a benefit. Do we look at our hardships with the right perspective? Philippians chapter 1 and 2. If not, God's word is there for us to be able to read and remember and hopefully given an opportunity like Patrick to sit back and reflect along the tranquil shores of Ireland and hear God speaking to him. Uh, what an awesome opportunity. So Patrick took that time to uh, learn about Scripture. And like I said, he, Scripture would just flow from him. And like Dieter said, sometimes you get it all mixed up. That's, that's not a problem. Patrick would do the same thing. In uh, one of his confessions here, we see him starting to quote Philippians 2. And then he moves into 2 Timothy 4.1. He says, and look, and we look to his imminent coming again, the judge of the living and the dead. Then he slips into Romans 2, 6, who will render to each according to his deeds. And he poured out his Holy Spirit on us in abundance, the gift and seal of immortality, which makes the believers 
into sons of God and co-heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. And we worship one God in the Trinity of holy name. Now, this is something else that Patrick was known for, or at least we say in our American tradition. By the way, St. Patrick's Day and all of the parades and things, that's just an American thing. The wearing the green and the pinching, that's all what Americans have taken what could be good and great celebration of what God did and turned it into a pagan celebration of who we want God to be or perhaps to leave God out altogether. Regardless of that, we say the three leaves of the clover to represent the Trinity, of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Really, we have no proof that Patrick actually did that. There are a lot of shamrocks or clover that grow in Ireland. We don't really know if he, if he did that. We do know that he believed in the Trinity. Now, just a little a quick aside. I told my daughter that I would share this with y'all. Must have been so bored that one of them was looking through a clover patch and found a genuine four-leaf clover. Those are supposed to be lucky, which I don't understand why, because that takes away from the Trinity, unless you're trying to add something to it. So the four-leaf clover is bad. Um, <laughs> not, not lucky at all. So looking back, getting on track now to Patrick, uh, we know that he was born at zero years old. I was the same age when I was born. That's, that's how I know. When he was 15, he was, had this mysterious and serious sin that he talked about in his confessions that we're going to talk a little more about. He says in Confession 27, I had perpetrated on a day, nay, rather in one hour. In other words, a split-second decision that he made that was not the right decision. In my boyhood, because I was not yet strong in virtue. God knows, I do not, whether I was 15 years old at the time, and I did not then believe in the living God, nor had I believed since my infancy. Talking about that, He committed a sin, but it was during a time that he did not know God, but he did know the truth of God's word because they were being taught by his family and in his church. So when he was 16 is when he was captured and made a slave and became a shepherd, which allowed God to uh, give him some opportunity to reflect on his life and to make good decisions. One of the things he wrote in Confession 13 was that he felt like that he was just a stone stuck in the mud. And that God reached down, pulled him out of the mud, cleaned him off, and made him a part of a beautiful structure that God was building. So Patrick understood that he was a part of something bigger than himself, just one small, seemingly insignificant part, but he was obedient to do what God was calling him to do. Not just obedient to obey, but to seek God and know what God wanted him to do to do. And I think that's exactly where each and every one of us, whether you consider yourself insignificant or not, uh, Patrick did talk about, of course, when he was in Ireland spreading the gospel, he never took any gifts from anyone because he wanted, he didn't want anyone to owe him anything. And he, he liked to live lowly. And he had a, a keen understanding of what being rich was. And Patrick talked about that, how difficult it is to, for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. It's not a sin at all to be rich. It just makes it hard to get into the kingdom of God. And why is that? Because we have the resources available that we can usually take care of things. And sometimes we even tell God that we can help him out. God, I, I have this and I can share it with you and I can help you do the things that you want to do, which, which on the surface is, well, On a deeper level, it's good. On the surface, it's not good because here you are telling God how you can help him. And that's not what God wants. God doesn't want our help. God wants our obedience. And so Patrick understood that. He did not want to at all seem rich, but a a lowly, insignificant individual built into a bigger wall of of a structure that God was building to be able to do his will. One of the other things we talked about in Confession 16 there on the prairies of Ireland is his prayer life. He spent a lot of time in prayer. And if you can imagine, if you're just you and the sheep and you've come to a knowledge of God and understand the concept of communing or or speaking to God, you find that you have a lot of time to pray. When do we find that we do not have a lot of time to pray? Things are busy at work. Things are crazy at home. 
the kids have soccer practice, then they have baseball practice, then they have football practice, and it's, it's not even football season. And we have uh, those hobbies and those extra things that we do. And we, we, we also work in the church and, and ministries that go along with that. And we're, we get so busy doing so many things that if we were to take a quick look at our prayer life, some of us might have to say, it's a little lacking. Patrick was talked about that during the prayer that he gained a better love for God, love for others, which was demonstrated in his life, and the opportunity to hear and know God. He said that prayer was a big part of that. Just Not just talking to God and saying, dear God, this is what I want, this is what I need, and my dad hurt his hand and please help him and please do all these things, but a, a lot of time just to sit and listen to God communing with Patrick. A two-way conversation. So as a slave, when he was 22 years old, there was a vision or a dream that Patrick had. And in the dream, he dreamt, I like that, <laughs> using the correct grammar of dream, he dreamt that a ship was coming to take him home to England. He had, there was no telegraph. He didn't uh, look on the internet to see the schedule of the ships. He was still a slave. So he sneaks off and walks 200 miles to this particular port that was revealed to him in, in the dream. And he gets there and there's this big ship there. He goes up to the captain and he says, hey, I would like to have uh, a ride on your boat. And it turned out that the boat, well, I say turned out, it so happens that the boat was going to the exact port in England that would need be for Patrick to get home. Now, those are amazing coincidences if you don't believe in the power of God. Otherwise, it's just God doing what God does to move Patrick on from where he was onto the next stage of his life. Patrick was tuned into God and had the opportunity to know what to do next. So he goes, but the captain of the ship says, you're not going on this ship. So what did Patrick do? Explain the whole thing? No, he just left and started praying, God. Uh, did I miss it? What do you want from me? What, what's next for me? I don't know what it is because the boat's not going to work out for me. Until a, a shipmate comes running up and then said, hey, the captain changed his mind. You can stow aboard or you can come aboard. I guess he wouldn't be a stowaway in that case. You can come aboard. And so Patrick gets on the ship and they take him home. Now, while Patrick is on the ship, of course, if you've been a slave for the past six years, what are you going to do now that you've gained some freedom? Relax. Spend a little time on the promenade deck, you know, playing shuffleboard. You're going to do the things that you've not been able to do all these years. But not Patrick. He spends his time talking about the things of God to the captain and to the crew. And according to, uh, not really a way to prove this, but that he saved the crew. He, well, he didn't save them. The, he gave them the gospel and they were very interested. And some of them came to the knowledge of Christ and accepted him as their savior. They get to the port in England. Uh, now, a lot of this we get from his confessions, which is autobiographical. And, you know, sometimes you can say a lot of nice things about yourself that may or may not be totally true. Um, there are some cooperation in other scripture, uh, other writings, but not many. But one thing that I read outside of Patrick's own writing was that when the ship had docked there in England, they still had to walk a long way and they were uh, days and days, they were feeling faint and not doing too well. And of course, all the guys are going, you know, hey, where's your God that you placed your faith in that you were telling us about? And about that time, this herd of wild boar come running across. Well, they all jump on the boar and they grab them, they eat them up for dinner that night. And that helped the, the crew to say, hey, maybe there's something a little more to this God that Patrick's talking about, this one true God, as opposed to in the area, the very polytheistic, uh, you pray to certain gods to get certain things. So he makes it home. He had a great message for his shipmates. Um, this whole thing reminds me of the prodigal son, where for Patrick, he did not tell his family he wanted to leave. He, he was taken, uh, his freedom was taken away from him. But as he comes back and reunites with his family, it reminds me of the prodigal son and that Patrick would very much see him within that story that Jesus told, the parable that Jesus told of going away, being a pagan and rebellion indivi rebellious individual, Realizing the error of your way, coming to faith, coming to your right mind, as it says in Jesus' parable, and comes home to his family. There again, you might be thinking, now he can just relax. 
He's, he's, he's had a difficult time of, of spiritual journey and that God was able to do some things in his life and now he's retired. <laughs> so what do you do when you retire? Well, certainly a lot of different things, but what did Patrick do? He had a dream. And in the dream, he was given from an Irish man several letters. And as he was reading the letters, he heard these voices from Ireland calling him to come back and teach them the gospel. And so Patrick couldn't even go to sleep that night. He stayed up all night thinking about this dream. A lot of times our dreams are from what's on our mind. Uh, he probably had a love for the Irish people, even though they treated him not very well. Of course, it could have been worse if he wasn't a, a shepherd. But being a shepherd allowed him a, a little bit of freedom, but still not treated well. And when you, when you go back to Ireland, or when he goes back to Ireland, he doesn't have any kind of legitimacy in the country. In England, he, he's a citizen, and so you are afforded certain legitimacies and certain positive things that come across as that. But when you go back to this foreign country, you're at their mercy. So what does uh, Patrick do? He wants to go back, but first he wants to train more in spiritual things. He wants to know a lot more before he goes back. And so he becomes a deacon in the church. And when you become a deacon, you have to uh, kind of throw out some of the bad things that you've done, confess your sins, this kind of thing. He confessed this very mysterious and serious sin that he committed when he was 15 to one of his friends. So later on, when he was going to become a bishop, which was in the progress, was when he was 60 years old. So from 30 to 60, he's continuing to, to put himself in school, in, a, in probably a, a monastery somewhere, to learn about the things of God, to grow up and to have a great understanding, to be able to go back and still have the people of Ireland in his mind to go back to teach. So in preparation for a bishop, well, now they're really serious. All of the church leaders, they go around to all of your friends and all the people and try to find out more about you because they don't want to make any mistakes of making a bishop. <laughs> like That's true. So a lot of bishops made bishop for reasons other than the good things. But for Patrick, they talked to this friend and they found out about this sin where the friend wasn't really throwing him under the bus. He was just being truthful. You know, hey, yeah, he, he confessed his sin, but God's forgiven him and he's ready to do these great things. But it almost stopped uh, Patrick from becoming a bishop. Uh, so Patrick was, was just floored that this would stop him from becoming a bishop. And so he, he prayed to God and here again had another dream. And it was affirmed that God was with him, that God had forgiven him of this. And so Patrick got out of this dream, this vision that, God had forgiven him. So if anyone was going to give him a hard time or prevent him from doing whatever it was that God had for him, that it wasn't just against Patrick, but it was against God as well. So he gained strength from this. He plowed on and eventually he was made bishop. So he did return to Ireland. Uh, not sure exactly when. And while he was there, he saved, or I keep saying he saved. He didn't do the saving. He did the preaching that's where you go and you tell, you forth tell, you tell about the gospel. It's an attention getter, seriously. Then you do the teaching and you teach about the things of God. So any Christian who goes along with the Great Commission, that you go there for teach, uh, about, um, sorry, you go there for teaching all people everything that you have learned. It's a part of the gospel that's commissioned to all Christians, not just the special ones who were insignificant and then became special, but for all Christians that we are supposed to go there for and teach others about what God has done to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe everything that you have learned. In order to do that, you must learn. That's what Patrick did. He took that to heart and he wanted to learn as much as he could so he would have everything that he needed when he went back. And he's, he, he literally, as a 60-year-old plus man, walked the island of Ireland several times at every clan, at every group that he saw, teaching the gospel, preaching to them. And as a result, people started coming to faith. Thousands and thousands of people came to faith. Over 300 monasteries and churches were established. And Patrick was the one that was anointing bishops in order to be the leaders of that church in order for them to learn and grow in that area. And so he established the whole gospel. And that's what Patrick's known for is bringing the gospel to Ireland and made a significant difference as a result. In fact, today, if you go to Ireland, when you're greeted, it means God be with you. 
That's just their general greeting for everyone. It means uh, they say hello. What their meaning is, God be with you. It's ingrained in their culture. And Patrick is the one that God used to do this. So while he was back uh, in Ireland, going back and forth teaching, he was also captured several times, beaten. Uh, it wasn't a, a great thing. You feel like, oh, well, now he's a saint. And, but he wasn't a saint until later. And that's what the Catholic Church said. He had a very difficult time. So when we're doing God's will, it's not always easy. That doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. It just means that in your hardship, you can learn how to minister to other people. Patrick knew how to minister to people who had been enslaved, people who were having difficult times. And he spent a lot of time with uh, slaves and also with the sick, um, ministering to them because he had an understanding of what it was. Croticus ended up being a pirate king who came in and and the marauding band had... uh, enslaved, uh, taken away some of the converts that pirate, I'm sorry, that Patrick had talked to. And as a result, Patrick wanted to go and help them to be freed. And so he wrote a letter to Croticus, who was supposed to be a, a Christian, one of the Christians. And he wrote this long letter and uh, we, I don't have it for you today. I'm not going to read through it. But basically what the letter said is that um, I, a humble man, write you, Croticus, would you please let these people go? You know it's not right. And if you don't, I'm going to excommunicate you from the church. Now, that's a pretty serious charge, especially when there's only one church. Uh, here today, if you don't like what if the Baptists you know, throw you out, you go down to the Methodists. And then if they throw you out, you still got the Catholics, you got the Presbyterians. Uh, you could go on. You got the Scientists the Church of Scientology, Uh, you could find someone who will let you in. But if you are focused on what God is telling you to do, you don't look to go to another church. You seek and you read and you study and you learn. But for them, excommunication means you couldn't come back to church. That was a pretty serious charge. We do not know if Croticus ended up coming back and letting them go. We don't know any of the results of it. He, he sent a priest with a letter. That was probably a very perilous journey for the priest who probably got killed as a result. But Anyway, these are just some insights that we have to Patrick's life and what he did and how he lived and what he wanted to do as an insignificant man to do everything that he could to the glory of God, to speak boldly in spite of the fact that he was uh, constantly put down and marginalized in the area that he was in. Uh, the last thing that we have is that we, uh, the writing that we have is his Fied Fieda, which I don't speak that language, so I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Anybody who can correct me later. Uh, translated, Deer's Cry. This was kind of a chant that uh, most people agree that Patrick wrote. And it was a chant that, and I'm going to ask us to chant it in just a moment. So be looking over it. It was a chant that when the marauders came to enslave them or they were captured and beaten or told they couldn't preach the gospel in a particular place, he and his group would chant this as a reminder, almost like scripture being memorized that can be called back up to your mind when you're in that difficult hardship situation. So we're going to chant the deer's cry written by Patrick. It sort of reminds me, uh, you can say what you want to of Joel Osteen. Uh, There are some things that are not great, some things that that are good. One of the things I think is great is that when he starts off, what does he do? He takes his Bible and what does he say? This is God's word. I am what it says I am. I'll do what it says. I don't know the the whole thing. But I think that's a great thing for Christians to come together and commune together and as a group say, hey, this is what we are about. This is what Patrick wrote uh, based on scripture, but his own words. Would you repeat after me? I bind to myself today the power of God to guide me the might of God to uphold me, the wisdom of God to teach me, the eye of God to watch over me, the ear of God to hear me, the word of God to give me speech, the hand of God to protect me, the way of God to prevent me, the shield of God to shelter me, the host of God to defend me, 
against the snares of demons, against the temptations of vices, and against the lusts of nature. Against every man who meditates injury to me. Isn't that beautiful? It reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, so we can go to the Elmo, if I can see it here. In the Shema, in chapter 4, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Can y'all see that? It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Here's the verse 8. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall, they shall be as frontals between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I think Patrick was thinking of this when he starts off, I bind myself today, God, your word. I bind it to the frontals of my forehead, into my brain. I'm going to be diligent to teach that what I have already learned and understand about you. And if I have a choice between doing ball practice or going to church, I'm going to skip the World Series and I'm going to go to church because I'm going to take every opportunity to do the greater good because, by the way, you snatched me out of the mud that I was stuck in. You cleaned me off and you're building me into this beautiful palace of your doing. And I think that's more important than the other decisions that I can make. Not that the other things that I do are wrong, but when it comes to a choice of choosing one thing or another, I have chosen today whom I will serve. The decision has already been made. So your points for home. God can use a lot for a little. A good example of that is Moses, who when God said, hey, I've got a plan for you. Go and do it. What did Moses say? I am not very skilled in speech. So what did God say? Throw your staff down. It became a snake. He said, pick it back up, which was probably a long time until he finally did. And then it became a staff again. And he says, I'm going to use this staff to free my people from Pharaoh. I just, the staff needs some transportation. Can't do it without you. I need you to be a part of the plan. I just need you to do your part. God can do a lot with a little. 1 Timothy 1.15 is Paul says, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. We're not prideful, great people. We're, we're sad and lonely. But whatever God can do, he wants to do because he partners with us. He commissions with us. That's his plan we have the choice whether to get in on it or not. Second thing, hardship should draw us closer to the Father. 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. Well, it's 2 Corinthians 2, 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves were comforted by God. Our hardships put us in a position to number one, let other people come alongside us and comfort us. So if you, during your hardships, are too prideful to not allow them to come cook a meal for you, to come over and and keep your kids or or take you to the hospital or, or do whatever, if you're too good for that, you need to step down a couple of notches. Read Philippians 2, because God equipped them to be able to minister to you, but better yet, Through the hardship, you will learn and see God's comfort and you will be better able to comfort those who are in a similar situation later on down the road. We don't want to miss that. I talked about my family and our infertility problems and seven years of of sadness. But now my wife especially is able to go to, to young ladies who are in similar situation and say, hey, I'm not just the person saying, God's got this. Oh, he'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. I can talk to you about all the ugly bumps in the road. 
Isn't that more meaningful than just the guy that says, stop worrying about it, just relax? It is. The last thing, number three, the psalm of your life. Patrick went back after his life and he went back in his confession, talked about all the things that went on in his life, which is a benefit to us to be able to see how God moved in this man's life. The book of Psalms is very similar to that in the sense that we see the good and the bad as people wrote down what what God had done in their past and also what they were hoping for God to do in the future. My encouragement to you is to either in your mind or maybe even to jot down on a piece of paper this next week or two, the psalm of your life. Can you reflect on what God's done in your life? It's a great step in the spiritual journey to reflect on those things, just to jot down, where have I seen God moving? And what can I do in the future as I go forward? What am I hoping for? What does God want from me?